interpreting this passage because some of the things he says apply directly to the apostles and what they would experience and what they would go through. You see that, for instance, clearly when he talks about uh, the, the temple in just the previous section. That was, of course, destroyed uh, effectively in the lifetime of, of the apostles. But then as you go through the passage, there is a, a transition from the, the present trials that they were going to face to looking to the trials that come at the end time. And um, very clearly by verse 25, you are into the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, where there's this sign, uh, and there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. That There's going to be this great upheaval right before the Lord returns. So some of the things he says here apply directly to the apostles. Some of them apply directly to the end. But we can look at it tonight sort of zoomed out for a moment. And we'll get into looking at end times more directly next week. But I titled the message, Opportunities. We all know that there are challenges in life, that the persecution that and the the mockings and the revilings that we we all face it, we, we do face it put it that way now we have to be honest the persecution and the suffering that we experience in this country is nothing compared to what happens around other places in the world um, you know some of the people that debbie gets to minister to come from nations that are truly hostile to the gospel in an official capacity. Um, and we, that's happening today. It's certainly what the apostles faced. Uh, how many of the apostles, this is a bit of a trick question, but how many of the apostles suffered a martyr's death? Except for who? Kevin said it, right? Except for John. And what was John's retirement like? <laughs> He was on an island, right? It was great. Um, uh, church history thinks that uh, he did get released from that and spent his last days actually serving in churches. But it's not like he had this ideal, easy life in retirement. It was hard. It was, it was difficult. There was, there was lots of suffering. Perhaps, maybe not in your lifetime, depending on how old you are, but perhaps in Obadiah's lifetime, that type of suffering, that type of persecution, this isn't a happy thought, Obadiah, but he might experience that in this country. Or maybe, or maybe one of you, or, you know, and I guess I could talk to the, the younger people, but any of you could be sent by the Lord to a country and face suffering and, and persecutions for the sake of of the gospel. So we could say that we, we know that things will be bad, can be bad, could get bad. Now, on the other hand, we want to be positive on the pos power of the gospel. We could be on the cusp of a great revival. The theme of our Senate this year is biblical revival. And on all the messages are uh, loosely based around a book written, uh, I believe, by Martin Lord Jones. I should know who wrote it. I'm reading it right now. I think it was Jones on revival, a series of lectures he gave on revival. And perhaps the Lord is going to bring a great awakening that m maybe makes the history books as the, the, the gr third great awakening, or we probably would call it something fancier than that. I was trying to think of some the digital awake, I don't know what it would be called, but th that could happen. Also, we see troubling signs, don't we? Look at what Jesus says in verse 11, particularly the verses 11 and 12 tonight. And really, actually, back up to verse 10, where he speaks about nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
And the great earthquake shall be in, in various places and famines and pestilence and fearful signs and, and, and or fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these things, he says that th things are going to get bad and perhaps is, is alluding then to, to later like verse 25. But before all of that, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. He says things for you apostles are going to get bad. And you are going to be persecuted. You are going to be delivered up to the synagogue. Real quick, think, think about the book of Acts. Who's the first person to be delivered up to the synagogue um, in Acts? So we're post-resurrection, ascension of Jesus. The apostles are doing their ministry. Who's, who's the first one to get dragged in front of the, this, uh, the synagogue? Do you remember? Is it, is it Philip or is it Peter? Yeah. But they both were, weren't they? And uh, we'll have to go look that up later to see uh, which one was first. And th they got dragged into the synagogue. Do you remember why? And it doesn't matter which one was first because it was the same reason. Why were they dragged into the synagogue? Sophie? For sharing the gospel. For, sharing the gospel. for, for preaching the word of God. For doing, you think about Peter and John, uh, they, they appear before the, the, the synagogue, the Sanhedrin, and uh, the, the, so the, the chief rulers, the highest court they had, and they said, don't preach Jesus. And they beat them and let them go. And then what do you find them doing in the very next section? They're preaching again, aren't they, Sophie and Obi? Yeah, they're preaching Again, they're doing that very thing. Some of them were delivered in, uh, into prisons. Some of them were martyred. Some of them were appeared before kings and rulers for the namesake of Jesus. Could you imagine doing everything the creator of the universe tells you to do? Fulfilling that commandment. And the reward that you get is jail, is prison. You, you think for a second, you're, you're driving down the road, you're, you're on 528, and you're going the speed maximum. In fact, you're going one mile under the speed limit just to be safe, because we should all do that. Right? So sections that are 60, you're going 59, you're doing everything right, and you get pulled over, and the, and, and, and the officers, and you say, oh, I'm sorry, officer, what, what's the reason for the stop? He says, you were going 59 miles an hour in a 60. Well, was that wrong? Nope, but you're going to jail. We would, we would be aghast at that, wouldn't we? Um, you can find videos of police officers pulling people over for going five miles under the speed limit because it was suspicious. Which I, th I, I find hilarious because that is the maximum you're supposed to go. But... Right? That just, it doesn't fit right. It doesn't sound right. And yet, that's what Jesus says will come. I'm going to do for my Senate. I'm speaking at Senate uh, Sunday night. And as I'm starting to work on that, I'm going to work through the four major prophets and the minor prophets. And I want to know how many prophets were told at the beginning of your ministry, of their, of their ministry, you're going to go to a stubborn people. You're going to go to a people who will not listen. I know it's more than one. Um, I, I don't think Daniel was told that, and, and his, his book's a little bit different format there, but many of them were told that very thing. Go, do what I told you to do, but people will oppose you. That things will be bad. That, that persecution will come. That life will not be easy and in fact humanly speaking your life will be harder because you're serving Jesus there's there's something about that that when we phrase it the right way it really bothers us you're doing everything right 
but things aren't going well. Um, as uh, Pastor Titu pointed out when he was here that he had heard on a podcast, you think about the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and we like to hear about the ones that conquered nations. But then what about the ones that were sawn in two? What about the ones that were martyred for their faith? The, the writer of Hebrews doesn't distinguish as one successful and one not. He holds both of them up as here are examples which we should look to and emulate and follow their faith. Because we can acknowledge something and we need to acknowledge something. We need to remind ourselves of something that Jesus says, starting in verse 13, that bad things are an opportunity. Notice what he says in verse 13. As, as you're being brought to the kings, you're being brought to the rulers, you're being delivered over to the synagogues, you've been put in prison, you're being persecuted, they're laying hands on you. All these things that are happening because it shall turn out, it shall result in an opportunity for you to testify. It'll lead to an opportunity for you to to witness to God that bad things are an opportunity. You know, it's one thing to give God glory when things are going well. It's one thing to praise the name of the Lord when we're getting everything we want. When I graduated high school, I was getting almost got everything I wanted. I wasn't, in, I wasn't in the highest GPA group, whatever they call that, the fancy Latin words. The fact that I don't know them is probably why I wasn't in it. But I was the first person in the second group. I thought that was pretty cool. And I, I got everything except I wasn't named the math student of the year, but that's another story for another night. But um, uh, everything was going well. And everybody was excited. My dad woke me up at 6 a.m. the next morning saying he was leaving my mother. And everything changed. You know, it's one thing to thank the Lord when, when things are going well. It is an entirely different thing to give God the glory in the midst of suffering. And it was this thought that really stopped me in my sermon preparation this week. And not the exact point, but sort of step back. When things aren't going well, or to phrase it a, a different way, when somebody needs you, it's an opportunity to express your love for them. When the children spill the milk, it's an opportunity to serve the children and to, to, to lovingly perhaps talk to them about not being so frantic with their emotions at the table and uh, being careful, but also it's not the end of the world, is it? Even if they were to spill, can't look at my kids when I say this, even if they were to spill the freshly made cup of coffee, What's more important to me as a father, my children, or my cup of coffee? And, and it's an important point, John. Don't make me laugh. But do my words in that moment express my love for them over the cup of coffee? And actually took the whole spoke to the whole family and apologized. I, I react poorly in those situations. I, I react much quicker than I should. I'm, I'm not slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to hear. I don't process it the way that I should. But, you know, we, we live in this glitz and glamour society where everybody thinks love is defined by the $200,000 wedding. What are the wedding vows? How does it go? It's been a long time since I did a wedding. In sickness and in health. In sickness, in weakness, you so love more. 
And it's our opportunity to, to serve one another. You know, when somebody's telling us how wonderful and how great we are and everything's going smoothly, it's easy to, to serve. Jesus even told us about that. You know, you love those that treat you well. Everybody does that. But what's unique about our Christian faith is Jesus says, love those who hate you. And just to be clear, to, to, to put a full circle on my children don't hate me I don't hate them I, we love each other but my words need to re, re, relate that to them it's not a burden to to serve and and that of course applies in so many things in in life even those that would despitefully use us we're to bless them we bless them that curse us because it's an opportunity to even demonstrate the love and the forgiveness of the gospel to other people. So much so that we understand that it is, it, it is this powerful testimony to give God the glory in the midst of suffering. I want to make a silly illustration that might bother some of you, but let me get the whole illustration out. Let's pretend for a moment that there was a federal law prohibiting the wearing of an orange color polo shirt. Now I know this bothers all of us for different reasons. Primarily our American DNA, we would all run out and buy orange color polo shirts and we would want to wear them. But let's say they started checking us at, at the grocery store. They said, you have a choice. You can go to jail for your orange color shirt, or you can put on this beautiful chartreuse looking shirt. I don't even know what color that is. I just made up a color. But you can put on this shirt instead. Now, what should we do? I'm going to argue, change shirts. It's not that big a deal. Now, as Americans, I know that bothers us. No, 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 we need to fight such tyranny and we should we should pursue it we should support those that are going to challenge it we should take it all the way to the supreme court do everything we can but should i really spend any nights in jail because i refuse to take off my orange shirt i would hope we see that that wouldn't be something to that wouldn't be the hill to die on there's ways we could fight it in this country and, and certainly we we could do that and, and, and try and protect our freedom because it starts with orange shirts. Where does it end? White shirts? Blue shirts? Yeah, blue shirts. Where does it end, right? Red shirts? They, they, but it's, it's a silly illustration. Now let's change the law. You can't preach Jesus. Now we ought to have a hill to die on. You know, I was thinking about it in the context of having young children. If, if I was to go to jail for wearing an orange shirt, how do I explain that to Zephaniah? Son, I really like the color orange. I'm really attacked. No, that doesn't make any sense. I can't defend that. But going to jail for preaching Jesus? I can explain that. He's the only name under heaven whereby men may be saved. And that's where our stand has to be taken. And you see that the powerful testimony to everybody that hears about it. Here is where they take their stand. Upon the name of Jesus, upon preaching the word of God. I know when we first started streaming, some people expressed concern that the government might watch. They might hack into our cameras and they might watch my reaction was i hope they do which shocked some old ladies i said what are they going to hear they're either going to be looking at an empty room maybe with me walking around talking to myself out loud praying but anyways they might they might observe that which ron caught me this week that's that's another story but um or they're going to hear our worship I hope they do. When uh, there was a law, I believe it was in Houston, about you couldn't say this or that, and they wanted sermons to turn, or pastors to turn in their sermon notes. And one of the pastors says, can, can I have a few hours? I need to spice it up a little bit for you. 
I need to be a little bit clearer about my position, about what the Bible says here. You see, it is a powerful testimony when we take that stand upon the Word of God and say, here I am, I can do no other. The Apostle Paul made this point. This is the point of the first chapter of the book of Philippians. He's in jail and he's excited. Maybe not the right word. He's rejoicing because he's getting to preach Christ and him crucified. And everybody learned in fulfillment, even of exactly what Jesus says here. Everybody throughout all of Caesar's palace was learning that he was there for Christ. Why are you, Paul of Tarsus, why are you here? Everybody could start to answer the, the question because he preaches Jesus. Well, who's Jesus? How is Jesus so real to him? One of my favorite quotes from early church history, uh, uh, writing, I think his name was uh, Plinius, something like that, writing to one of the Caesars saying, boy, these Christians... These people, they sing hymns unto Christ like they're singing to a God. What a wonderful testimony that they sang with such vigor and, and hardiness that they were praising their Lord in a time of persecution. That bad things, even zoomed out, whatever we're talking about, whether we're talking about a diagnosis, we're talking about a sickness, we're talking about losing a job, or we're talking about actual persecution, those bad things are an opportunity to tell people that Jesus is more important than anything else in my life. Yes, I lost my job, but I know Jesus will provide. And I know that Jesus provides through means. So yes, I'm going to be busy looking for another job, but I know that he'll provide. You know, we just, we just bought a new van or you, you guys know that, but it's sort of terrifying, isn't it? You drive it off the lot, all of a sudden it's yours. I, I, I don't know. You probably feel that way with a brand new vehicle. Now, now it's yours. Now you're responsible for this thing. What happens if something breaks? What happens if it this or that or the other? You know, we can be paralyzed by those fears, those trepidations. I mean, what happens if you, if you scrape the side of it? Will Bethany get mad when I come home from the gas station? No, she didn't even look at it. But anyways, um, right? you, you get worried about, as we talked about this morning, protecting our stuff. But what's that in comparison to serving Jesus? Maybe we have less in this life than other people. But does it matter? If we have Jesus, we are blessed with Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1. So even if we're taken before kings and rulers, it's an opportunity to testify. Jesus gives them instruction in verse 14 that when they go, they're not to make up their mind about what they'll say ahead of time. He says, settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. So the idea of what he's saying here <coughs> is don't write out your script ahead of time. Don't settle it in your hearts or settle in your hearts to not plan out. And that's the idea of the word meditate there. Don't plan out, don't rehearse what you're going to say at that time. It's kind of interesting instructions from Jesus to them. And again, this is where we have to make sure we're understanding. He's talking directly to them. And he says, don't, don't rehearse it. Why is that? Well, in many ways, you cannot prepare for how you'll be attacked. When I was first out of seminary, I got used to get asked this question a lot. I haven't been asked it in a long time. But... Does seminary prepare you for ministry? And I used to always tell people yes and no. Yes, it gives you the tools. But no, it doesn't prepare you for every exact thing that somebody's going to bring up. Every exact ob objection that you ever hear. Because nobody can prepare for that. People are very creative in their complaints, their excuses, their 
proofs against the Bible. Some of those things take study and, and preparation and, and thought of how to answer them. So he's telling them, don't, don't prepare how to be attacked. But that doesn't mean they weren't to prepare in some way. They were certainly to prepare by deepening their relationship with Jesus. And we can be prepared for that too. It's keeping a close walk to the Lord, daily time with Him. You may not know what the day provides, but, I, but Jesus does. And Jesus can provide for you. Jesus can guide you. And as our relationship with Him grows, we are prepared for what happens. You know, Debbie called me yesterday, says, I'm bringing a friend to church. Could you talk about the gospel? And, and everything that I said this morning was prepared by Tuesday, basically. And I said, you know, I, I told Debbie, I said, you know, I, ha I have this whole, whole point when we went to the Micah passage. And when I was going through it, I was like, should I really do that? Should this really be here? And I, well, I, I'll leave it in. And the Lord knew, didn't he? The Lord knew, knew exactly. And, and we give him all the glory for that. Notice what he says in verse 15. He says that he will provide for he says, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom. Which all your adversaries should not be able to gainsay nor resist. He says, I'll give you a mouth. It's an interesting phrase, but the idea here is he's going to give them the boldness. He's going to give them the boldness to open, to use that mouth for the glory of God, to be a witness and to be a testimony he will also give them wisdom. There, there was this book that I read once, and it was about evangelizing different groups of, groups of people. And uh, it was written by a man who was kind of philosophical, and it was a fun read. But when I was done reading it, I had no idea how to argue with anybody. It was so kind of technical. And we can, we can overcomplicate things. But I like to think about the blind man. Do you remember the blind man? He's not blind anymore. And that causes a huge stink among everybody who, who knew him. Because he says, you were blind, now you're not. How did that happen? And he said, Jesus did it. They said, no, 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 Jesus can't do it. He's not, he's not a prophet. He, no, no, no. And the man says, well, this is, I know. Once I was blind, and now I'm not. This is what I know about Jesus. This is what I know about my God. I know my God is the God of forgiveness, the God of mercy. He will take care of me. We have that boldness and we, we have that wisdom. And you notice in verse 15 that the results will be powerful. The results will be powerful. Which all your adversaries should not be able to gainsay nor resist. Now sadly, many times that happens to their shame and ruin. Because they, they can't, can't disprove it. But they also don't believe. And they're lost in their, their unbelief and their hatred for the gospel. But Jesus promises us He'll provide. To put it a little bit different, to go with this morning's message, His word is enough. And as we know the Word, and as we're studying the Word, and as we're, we're planting the Word into our hearts, it'll come out in those times of adversity. It'll come out in those times of struggle. And it will be the power of God working through us as we give testi testimony, witness to His greatness and His goodness. So by way of conclusion, very quickly, I have five ways I, I want us to apply this. Number one, we must view hardships and sufferings as an opportunity to witness for the Lord. One of uh, the greatest opportunities Bethany and I ever had to witness to a neighbor is when the, the apartment complex was on fire. And she wanted to save all her stuff. And we're like, it's not worth it. We're, we're good. And we were outside. It was a Sunday. We were, you know, not, you know, I had my undershirt on. It was snowing outside in Tacoma. We're just kind of literally chilling out there while waiting for, the, they cleared the building. And, and she told us later, man, you guys were so calm. 
You didn't worry about any of your stuff. Why would we? Our stuff probably wasn't worth a tenth of what her stuff was worth, I'm guessing, but all our furniture was free hand-me-downs from the youth room at the Tacoma Church, and um, her stuff was not. But also, we said, look, the Lord will provide. In those times of hardships, in those times of, of difficulties, it is a powerful testimony. Secondly, if we're going to do that, if we're going to be that witness, we need to have a meaningful relationship with Jesus. And this means careful and thoughtful attention to the means of grace. Careful and thoughtful attention to the Word of God, to prayer, sacraments, and then I'm going to add to it, just sort of informally, Christian fellowship. Christian fellowship, iron sharpening iron that the Lord gives us and, and giving careful attention to those things to help in our relationship with Jesus. If we're going to be a witness and we're going to be a testimony, if people are going to ask us for the hope that is within us, it's going to come as we have that deep abiding relationship with Jesus. Third, this relationship with Jesus will lead to suffering. Verses 16 and 17. He says to them, And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. When I read that, my mind goes to the Apostle Paul, who is on the road, is going to go into that town, is going to arrest the Christians. He's got those letters to put them in chains. He's struck by the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes to faith, and then he has to be let down in a basket so he can escape with his life. Nobody could doubt the relationship that Paul had with Jesus. I believe it was in the city of Thessalonica, but it might have been Lystra. He upsets some people. They take him out of the city and they stone him. Like, in my thinking, if I get stoned by the people of a city, I'm good. I'm just going to move on to the new city. If you guys stone me, I'll just move on. But we don't really have any stones around. But, right? but what does Paul do? He gets up. He goes back into the city. He says, well, he's tired. And then he preaches the next day in the city. There's no doubt that Paul loved Jesus and wanted to serve Jesus and was willing to suffer. Fourth, we must rely more and more upon Jesus for boldness. This prayer of Paul, which can be found right after the whole armor of God passage, it's one of those sections that does always stop me as well. Paul's asked this, and also for me, he's talking about prayer. They said, this is how you can pray for me. That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. If Paul, after years in jail for being bold, needed prayer of God's people for boldness, how much do all of us need that to pray for one another, to pray for ourselves? As we looked at some of those promises in Sunday school this morning, the promises of God that we do not fear are based upon the presence of God, are based upon that relationship with the Lord. And then lastly tonight, Jesus is our protector. Jesus is the one that protects us. Look at verses 18 and 19. Verse 17, everybody's going to hate you. Verse 18, but there shall not be a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. It's an interesting statement in verse 18, isn't it? He just said some people will die, but then he says... Not a hair of your head will be touched. Now, is that a contradiction? Of course not. It's Jesus. But let's recognize this. Let man do his worst. 
And he can kill the body. But that's it. God will take care of your soul. And there's a world that's coming where no hair of your head will ever be touched by the oppressors ever again. Where we'll leave it, live in perfect peace and joy and holiness with our Lord. If man were to do something to us, we know that the Lord is still protecting us. We know that by faith and that we'll be with him. And so let us look to the Lord. Let us seek those opportunities when bad things happen. To give God the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can study it this night. And we ask, Lord, as we look at this challenge, that in the bad things we would give glory to your name, that we would witness for you, that our lips would express our love, even for our enemies. Father, we ask that that relationship with Jesus would be what drives that. Grant it to us that we would have a closer walk with you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.